Mr. Teru, in this math lesson, we're going to do two examples of solving quadratic inequalities. In our first example, as you can see, we are going to know our coefficients ultimately of a, b, and after we get this thing set equal to zero, c. And in our second example, uh, we're going to see something that, um, well, I didn't ever experience or see in any of my textbooks that I was teaching out of until I started teaching IB mathematics. And in standard level and higher level IB mathematics, uh, they'll give you questions like this where it says something like, solve for an unknown such that this quadratic inequality is always greater than or less than or equal to zero. So it's a different twist on it, and we're going to be taking a look at that. It's, more, it's a pretty interesting question for a second example. I have uh, two other lessons, by the way, related to this, solving higher order polynomial inequalities and solving rational inequalities. I'll put links to those lessons in the description of the video. I'll also put timestamps to uh, our two examples. Of course, don't need a timestamp for the first one. We're starting it right now. We've got negative 2x plus 11x is greater than or equal to 14. And solving a quadratic inequality is really just the same in the beginning as solving for a quadratic equation. You've got to get that thing set equal to 0. So we're going to uh, bring the 14 over. We have negative 2x squared plus 11x minus 14 is greater than or equal to 0. I don't like to solve quadratics uh, by factoring, and this one is factorable, um, unless my leading coefficient is 1. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to factor out a negative 1. You could also just, um, uh, we're going to have our 2x squared minus 11x plus 14. We're going to factor this quadratic. And in case you've forgotten, that's another reason why I'm doing this uh, particular example, because students often struggle with factoring. If you want to factor a quadratic where the leading coefficient is anything other than 1, what you want to do is you want to take your leading coefficient and your constant and multiply those together. And then you're going to be looking for factors of this product that add to the middle term. Now our middle term is negative, uh, with our last constant being positive. The factors that we use for 28 both have to have the same sign. So we're looking at two negative factors. We have negative 1 times negative 28. We have negative 2 times negative 14. We have negative 4 times negative 7. And here's the pair that we want to focus on. Negative 4 times negative 7 is equal to 28, but they also, when you add them, equal negative 11. So we're going to use these two factors of 28 to rewrite our middle term as, well, two terms. So we have negative parentheses 2x squared. We have minus 4x minus 7x plus 14 is greater than or equal to 0. And now that we have our quadratic, our three-term quadratic written as a, uh, with four terms, we're going to factor by grouping. We're going to look at what can we take out of our first two terms. Well, these both have a common factor of 2x, so we're looking at 2x times x minus 2. We're going to factor out a negative 7. So, negative 7 negative 7x divided by negative 7 is x, and we have 14 divided by negative 7, which is equal to negative 2. And now inside this parentheses, we have uh, two terms, 2x times x minus 2, and a second term, which is 7 times x minus 2. Each of these two terms have a common factor of x minus 2, so factoring that common factor out of these two terms leaves us with, uh, with a negative out front, taking out the x, I don't need another set of, well, yeah, uh, x minus 2. If we take this factor out of our first term, that's going to leave us with 2x. And if we take this factor, factoring out this um, factor of x minus 2, that's going to leave us with a negative 7. We're going to set each of these equal to 0, giving us x equals 2. And x is equal to 7 halves. And now the one way of looking at this is to think, okay, at this value of x value of 2 and at this x value of 7 halves, this 
quadratic is going to be equal to zero, and that happens to be, for this particular example, part of my solution. So on a number line, our critical value here is x equals 2, and x is equal to 7 halves, which is 3 and a half. So we got 1, 2, 3, right? 1, 2, 3 and a half. And we're going to test some intervals. Basically, we're looking at testing the interval from negative infinity to 2, and then the interval, I'm using interval notation, by the way, of going from 2 to 7 halves. And then I'm going to be looking at the interval from 7 halves to infinity. And I'm going to just simply plug a number from each of these intervals into this expression, kind of like my function, if you will, negative 2x squared plus 11x uh, minus 14, and test these intervals. And if one number in an interval works, then that entire interval works. If one number in that interval fails, then the whole interval fails. And because we have an equal sign in this inequality, these are actually going to be part of the solutions, but we want to check the intervals between those values and see which ones work. And it's going to look like this. You might be thinking of a faster way of doing this problem, by the way, and I will be going over that. Uh, we're going to have something to the left of 2, like eh, 0. So we have negative 2 times 0 squared plus 11 times 0 minus 14. Is that greater than or equal to 0? Well, negative 14 is definitely not greater than or equal to 0, so every number between negative infinity to 2 is not going to be a solution to this inequality. Well, let's try something between 2 and 7 halves, like 3. So now we're going to be looking at negative 2 times 3 squared plus 11 times 3 minus 14. That's going to yield us uh, 4 times, no, that would be 3 squared is 9 times negative 2 is negative 18, plus 33, minus 14. And we're getting kind of close here, but we have negative 18. Now we have negative 28. Now we have negative 32. Negative 32 plus 32, uh, let's try that again. Negative 32 plus 33 is going to be equal to 1. And yes, 1 is greater than or equal to 0. So one number between 2 and 3 halves makes this inequality true. So every number between 2 and 3 halves is going to be a solution to this inequality. Check. And finally, with, uh, let's see here, purple, we're going to pick a number that's larger than 7 halves, like 4. And I'm running out of room, but you've already seen me do the factoring, so we're going to go ahead and take this out. Hopefully you understood everything there. I'm sure you did. And we've got negative 2 times 4 squared plus 11 times 4 minus 14 is greater than or equal to 0. That's going to be 16 times uh, negative 2 is negative 32 plus 44 minus 14. Now we're looking at negative 32, negative 42, negative 46, plus 44 is negative 2, and that is not greater than or equal to 0. So one number in this interval failed, so this whole interval fails. So what is the solution to this quadratic inequality? Well, because of the equal sign, our critical values, of 2 and 7 halves are part of the solution, and every number between 2 and 7 halves is also a solution. So, what's the answer? Well, the answer is, on a, a closed interval, from 2 to 7 halves, and if your textbook and teacher are not using interval notation, you might say that the, the solution is x is greater than or equal to 2, and less than or equal to 7 halves. And that's how you solve a quadratic inequality.
all of this arithmetic of checking the intervals is kind of not necessary, especially if you know how to graph your polynomial functions. Uh, you, don't, you know something about n behavior and multiplicity of zeros. Uh, we talk a lot more about this in graphing higher order polynomials, but you have an even degree function, which means that, now I know this is a quad, hopefully you know this is a parabola, but you have an even degree polynomial, which means that the n behavior of your function is either um, going up to the left, or as x approaches negative infinity, the function approaches positive infinity, and as x approaches positive infinity, the function goes to infinity, or it's up to the left and up to the right. But now you have a leading coefficient, uh, which is negative, which is going to reflect the graph over the x-axis. So this is a parabola opening down, opening down forever to the left and down forever to the right. So I know my graph looks something like this. And I'm not going to worry about finding the y-intercept because for the purpose of this problem, that's not all that important. And when we, of course, now I've just said we got the factoring done and we don't need to see it anymore. But when we had this in factored form, which was negative 2x minus 7 and x minus 2, Those zeros came from factors that showed up an odd number of times. And this is going to give us as a basis for something called multiplicity. Hopefully you've heard about that from your teacher. And if a zero comes from a factor that shows up an odd number of times, the graph is going to go through the x-axis at that point. If a zero comes from a factor that shows up an even number of times, which I don't have here, but if this is a power of two, then the graph is not going to go through the x value of 2, it's going to touch the x-axis at the x value of 2. But these are both odd values, our multiplicity is odd. So with a super quick sketch, after the factoring, I'm not going to worry about where the vertex is necessarily because we only care about trying to solve this inequality. This is the sketch, not knowing exactly what the parabola, the, the vertex of the parabola is, but that orange graph is the sketch of y equals negative 2x squared plus 11x minus 14. And certainly, now that the graph is up here, I can easily identify where is this graph, this parabola, giving me y values which are greater than or equal to zero. Well, that's, and I hope these different colors show up on the camera, that's between I mean, I know they show up, but show up well enough for you to really see it well, between two and three halves. And that is how you solve a really basically a polynomial inequality. Get it set equal to zero, factor, set each factor equal to zero, solve it, and then either do all that work of testing those intervals along the x-axis, or if you know something about n behavior and finding those x-intercepts, which you had to do anyway, and the multiplicity, you could just do a sketch and let the sketch answer um, your question. Doing all this work though of checking the intervals is something you have to do when you solve rational inequalities. No little quick, well no easy way to quickly sketch um, a graph and get your answer from there. What do you do when you're asked to solve a quadratic inequality and you don't know the coefficients? Come on up right now. Na, 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 na. So for a second example, and really it's the meat, it's why I made this video, but I wanted to do that review at the beginning. Find the value of m and the quadratic inequality where we have m, square, uh, m times x squared plus 2mx plus x plus m minus 2 is less than or equal to 0. And this is what IB likes to do. Uh, they take what seems like a pretty basic concept and then they write these abstract problems that requires you to pull from different areas of mathematics and see how they all relate. It makes some of the questions really difficult, but ultimately it makes this curriculum so, so cool if you're, you know, a math nerd like I am. Well, you can't solve this inequality per se, like you think, you can't have the same thought process like we had in the previous example because, well, you have two variables in the same equation. What you need to focus on here is that it says find the value of m in the quadratic inequality. Basically, maybe I could add this, such 
that this quadratic is always less than or equal to zero, or maybe it will say greater than zero. It doesn't matter if it says less than or greater than. Um, the problem is going to be designed to work. You just have to find the unknown coefficient. See, this isn't like the previous question where we knew all of the coefficients and there was a possibility, you know, of there being index intercepts and, well, now, there's a possibility of this expression being greater than zero or less than zero or whatever. Like, I want this quadratic to always be less than or equal to zero. I don't, the door is not open for it to, like in the previous example, come up, pass through the x-axis, come back down and pass again below it. So you need to think about, oh man, let's see here. Parabolas can open up and not have an x-intercept. Uh, they can open up and touch the x-axis once. Uh, since we have an x-intercept where the graph is touching the x-axis, that means there must be a multiplicity of two. So basically we have the same two factors showing up, because it's only quadratic, the same two factors showing up twice. Or you can have that parabola opening up and crossing twice. Now I'm having all these parabolas open up, but uh, this is an inequality where the parabola has to always be below the x-axis. That's what, really what that means. So we're looking at a situation where either the parabola looks like this, where it's always below the x-axis. Um, we have maybe the parabola is coming up and touching the x-axis, but then going right back down again. And because we have not less than, but less than an equal to, that needs to be what happens. And then, you know, we can have a parabola opening up, of course, and crossing the x-axis twice. Does this sketching thing over here give you any idea of how we're going to approach this problem? What did you learn in mathematics that helped you determine whether a parabola crossed twice, once, or zero? If that doesn't ring a bell. Think about how you solve quadratic equations or find the x-intercepts for parabolas. You can complete the square. You can factor. And by the way, you can take the completion of the square process on your general ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero, go through the completing the square process and actually derive for yourself, if you haven't already done in your math class, the quadratic formula. And inside the quadratic formula, x is equal to the opposite of b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. Yeah, you have got a square root. And of course, when you start talking about an even root, there's a possibility of there being imaginary solutions. Yeah, this discriminant is what the problem is about. If your discriminant is, which is b squared minus 4ac, if that discriminant is less than zero, then there is no real solutions. And if that discriminant is equal to zero, because uh, you're going to be square root of a negative number, if, the, square, if the, this, uh, the discriminant is equal to zero, then we're, well, you're going to have negative b, the opposite of b, plus or minus zero. So really, whether you add or you subtract, it's not going to affect the value of the numerator. Divided by 2a, that means you have one real solution. that one real solution with the multiplicity of two, if you have it in factored form, like parentheses x minus two, close it, square it equals zero. And if your discriminant is greater than zero, well then you have two real solutions. And <clears throat> the only way for this parabola, which I guess must be opening down, um, to always be less than zero, unless it just actually touches the x-axis, is for that discriminant to be less than or equal to zero. We want to focus on the less than part because we, um, you know, we don't want any other solutions. So we're going to say that um, b squared minus 4ac, we need that thing to be less than or equal to zero. And if there was just a less than zero, we would not want any real solutions and we would just be making sure that that discriminant was less than zero showing that there is no x-intercept. So wherever that parabola is, 
it's always going to be giving you negative values because there's no real solutions. Well, that means that we need to identify what a, b, and c are. So we need to have a coefficient of x squared, a coefficient of x, and a constant, anything left that doesn't have a x term in it. So not much left to do here as far as that goes. We already have an mx squared, but we have, do have two terms with x. So we're going to factor out that x and say that we have plus 2m plus 1x, and then plus m minus 2 is less than or equal to 0. That means that our a value uh, is m, b is 2m plus 1, and c is m minus 2. Our discriminant is the uh, b, which is 2m plus 1 squared minus 4a, which is our m, times c, which is m minus 2. And we're looking for this to be less than or equal to 0. See, we have an inequality with only one variable now. So we're looking at 4m plus squared plus 4m plus 1, distributing that binomial together. We've got negative 4m times m is negative 4m squared. We have negative 4m times negative 2, which is going to be plus 8m. We're looking for that again to be less than or equal to 0. We have the m, 4m, and the minus 4m are canceling out. We have 4 plus 8 is 12m, plus 1 is less than or equal to 0, 12m is less than or equal to negative 1, and m is less than or equal to negative 1 12th, and that is the end of my last example. I'm Mr. True. Bam! Go do your homework.